Okay. So um, I know that the title of the talk was originally um, outcomes in cardiomyopathy, but it's really difficult to talk about just outcomes without also mentioning medical therapy. So while a lot of this talk is going to be review of, you know, good bread and butter, uh, heart failure, what you do with medication, some review of the evidence, there has been a little bit of um, new research done recently with a couple new medications, and we'll talk about appropriate use for those. And then um, some special situations in which um, cardiomyopathy involves particularly women and where if you recognize and treat in specific ways a little earlier, you really have an impact on outcome and improving outcome. So you heard a little bit earlier, I'm sure Dr. Nyer talked a little bit about the differences between the types of heart failure. And really, you have to look at the classification when you're talking about medical therapy, which is there's heart failure with reduced ejection fraction versus preserved ejection fraction. And quickly, we talk about HEF-REF or HEF-PEF. Uh, specifically, HEF-REF is when the ejection fraction is less than 40%, and in HEF-PEF, it's generally accepted that the ejection fraction is above 50%. And the interesting thing is that despite all of the trials and evidence and all the research we've done, most or pretty much all of our proven therapies are for HEF-REF. And there's really a lack of proven therapies for HEF-PEF, which makes it very difficult to treat. Um, specifically in my talk, I'm going to focus more on HEF-REF. And um, they've been a recent set of guidelines um, for the treatment of heart failure. Most recently, there was an update in 2016, but the main guidelines were found in circulation um, in 2013. So I'd, I'd uh, refer you to that as the main reference for this talk. So in general, uh, there's about one in five people in the US will develop heart failure. There is earlier onset in men. HEF-PEF is actually equal among women and men, though it's more common overall than HEF-REF. And that might be because we're diagnosing it more, um, it, you know, since it's a little bit more uh, recognized now, probably in the last decade. Overall, HEF-REF is more common in men. Over the last 20 years, overall, there's been a reduced incidence of heart failure. However, there's an increased percentage of patients with heart failure being classified as HEF-PEF and those HEF-PEF patients have higher rates of hospitalization. And overall, there's been an increase in the mortality rate from heart failure, specifically for HEF-REF. And something that's important to note, especially as you're thinking about where your patients are in the spectrum of what kind of therapy they need, the number of hospitalizations in the last one year is very predictive of their outcome. And we know that if you have two or more admissions in one year, the mortality increases to about 50% mortality. There are some special populations when we're talking about heart failure, um, in particular uh, African Americans and women. About 3% of the Af African American population eventually develop hypertension and most frequently that, I mean sorry, heart failure, and most frequently that has to do with hypertension. And it should be noted that across all uh, nationalities, hypertension is the number one risk factor for development of heart failure uh, with preserved and with reduced ejection fraction. Um, in African Americans, heart failure uh, happens at an earlier age of onset, and it's usually more advanced at the time of diagnosis. They do overall have higher rates of hospitalization and a much higher mortality rate. And then the other special population is women, and that's mainly because um, although they respond to therapy the same as men, there are some particular situations in which women develop cardiomyopathies like peripartum cardiomyopathy, which I think you heard about um, earlier, and also chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy, specifically because of the prevalence of breast cancer in women, but also because there's some research into the way women respond differently to chemotherapy and makes them a little bit more susceptible to chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy. It's important to note that when we're talking about medical therapy and outcome, the guidelines are based on the classification. And when you start different types of medicines is based on the clinical status of the patient. And so you'll often see these two different types of classification systems, the AHA and the NYHA class. And so just to review that for you all, there's AHA stages, A, B, C, and D. Stage A is someone who's at risk for heart failure. Classically, that's someone who has things like hypertension and other cardiac risk factors. 
And just to remind you, the hypertension is the number one risk factor for development of heart failure. Um, and then I put on there this thing called obesity paradox, which is something interesting, which it has been um, shown that patients who develop heart failure who happen to be obese actually have better outcomes than people who um, are thinner, uh, and we don't really know why. Um, AHA stage B are patients who have known structural heart disease, but don't actually have clinical heart failure, so they don't have any exertional symptoms, they're not admitted to the hospital with uh, fluid overload, you just know that they have the anatomical setup. Stage C is clinical heart failure, and stage D is refractory and stage disease. So these stage D patients are the ones who are on inotropes, uh, having LVADs, and talking about uh, transplant or listed for transplant. And then there's the NYHA class, which has generally been shown to be the most predictive of um, overall mortality. And the higher the NYHA class, the worse the outcome. So class one is they have no limitation of activity or symptoms with exertion. They can do whatever they want to do. They just happen to have a low ejection fraction. Class two is they have a slight limitation. Usually these patients are comfortable at rest but they do have some symptoms like exertional dyspnea with some activity. Class three, they have marked limitation, they're comfortable at rest, but with minimal activity, they get very symptomatic. And then class four is rest symptoms. So when we're talking about medical therapy for heart failure, we, the, in the literature, we kind of use this, this catchphrase, guideline-directed medical therapy. Um, and these are the medications when we talk about guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure to improve morbidity and mortality, these are the medications that we're talking about. So I'm just going to kind of run through them real quickly, ones that you've been familiar with for a while. The first is a beta blocker, which has a 1A indication. It improves mortality, more benefit, uh, sorry, morbidity, and also has been shown to improve LV remodeling and improve the LVEF. In beta blockers, you want to start them prior to hospital discharge. This was shown very clearly in the IMPACT heart failure trial. The only caveat to this is if the patient required inotropes during that admission, you want to be a little, a little bit more cautious with starting beta blockers before their discharge. And specifically, the medications that have been shown to be evidence-based beta blockers in the setting of heart failure are carvedilol, bisoprolol, and metoprolol succinate. Okay, so. Um, you might see a patient that comes to see you and they have heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction and you see they're on um, metoprolol tartrate um, or atenolol. You really want to switch them to an evidence-based beta blocker because those are the ones that have been shown to actually have these positive um, impacts on outcomes. Uh, the second type of medication are ACE inhibitors that also has a class 1 indication for patients with HEFREF. It improves their mortality, uh, their morbidity, and their symptoms. And there's a 1A indication for an ARB as first line if the patient is ACE intolerant. Um, but you can only use it as first line therapy. That's really a 2A indication. So the guidelines still want you to try an ACE first, unless you have a good reason like ACE intolerance, which would be like a, an ACE cough. So then you can start with an ARB as first line therapy. And then the other 1A indication is aldosterone receptor antagonists, so spironolactone or aplerinone. And those are 1A indications in patients who have symptomatic heart failure with an ejection fraction less than 35%, or if they have coronary disease and they have heart failure from coronary disease, so ischemic cardiomyopathy and their EFs less than 40, and diabetes, you want to go ahead and make sure that they're on an aldosterone receptor antagonist. And in these patients in spe specifically, you want to make sure that their creatinine is less than 2.5 in men or less than 2 in women before starting it, and their potassium is less than 5. There's been um, a, there's an interesting curve when the studies came out showing that aldosterone receptor antagonists were beneficial in heart failure. There was a significant increase in the amount of people going to the hospital with hyperkalemia because they were starting, they were getting started on it with either their creatinine a little too high or at baseline, you know, adding it to the ACE or the ARB, your K can go up. So when you make this change, you want to make sure that at least in the next two weeks, one to two weeks after starting the medicine, you recheck their labs, make sure their potassium is not becoming too high, 
and you want to be really careful with having them on potassium supplementation if they're on all these medicines at once. So we know, and there's been, there's been a lot of trials supporting these medications. Um, this data is from a, um, a meta-analysis, but basically if you combine all of the 1A indication medications, you see the relative risk reduction in mortality with each medication. So with a beta blocker, you decrease their mortality by 35%, an ACE, 23%, an aldosterone antagonist, 30%, and then we didn't really talk about uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy, but, in a, but 36%. And so if you do all of these therapies together, you get a 77% risk reduction. And basically the number needed to treat to prevent one death is four. So that's overwhelming evidence to use these medical therapies in all of your heart failure patients with reduced ejection fraction. A little bit um, on some of the newer medications. Um, just to reiter reiterate, because uh, there is a little bit of confusion I've, I've just seen um, amongst uh, cardiologists in the community is when to use some of these newer agents. Um, these specifically were addressed in the recent uh, 2016 guideline updates for heart failure. But basically, um, there's two new medications on the market right now for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The first is an ARNI. Um, you guys know it as Entresto. It now has a 1B indication um, for symptomatic heart failure patients who are already tolerating an ACE or an ARB. And you can replace those ACE or ARBs by this ARNI to further reduce their morbidity and mortality. Okay, the key to this is that the patient's symptomatic, so it's really not for patients who have NYHA class one heart failure, okay? And they also um, note that you want to make sure that you have at least a 36-hour washout phase. So when you decide, okay, I've got this, you know, NYHA 2, 3 patient, they're on, uh, the guidelines are that they have, a, they can tolerate at least uh, 10 milligrams of enalapril twice a day. You decide to make the switch, you stop the ACE or ARB, you give them 36 hours, then you start the Entresto. Um, the other new medication is Evabradine or Corlinor, and it has a 2A indication in patients with symptomatic heart failure who are currently on maximally tolerated doses of beta blockers and in sinus rhythm, which is key, but still have a heart rate above 70%, sorry, 70 beats per minute, and this medication has been shown to reduce heart failure admissions. Other uh, parts of uh, medical therapy that we should all consider for our HEFREF patients, hydralazine nitrate combination. This has been shown to sh have a mortality benefit in African Americans with very symptomatic heart failure, so stage three and four, and it's used in combination with a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor. You can use it a little earlier in patients who are intolerant to ACE or ARBs because they say um, they get hypotensive with other medical therapy or they have advanced renal disease and it, it precludes them from being on an ACE or an ARB. And then finally, digoxin, one of the oldest heart failure medications that we have. It has been shown to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalizations, but it only has that morbidity benefit. It doesn't have a mortality benefit. It still has a 2A indication, and a lot of this data was actually done before even the um, beta blocker trials, but it's not going to be repeated, so it, I think it's always going to have this 2A indication. It has been shown, though, that withdrawal of digoxin can precipitate a heart failure decompensation. So you want to be careful if you have a patient who's been on DIG for a long time and they come in and you decide to stop it or someone stops it in the hospital. It can be detrimental down the road. Uh, and then finally, um, diuretics, they have a 1C indication. Um, pretty much all of us who have heart failure patients know they usually are on a little bit of diuretic. The mainstay of therapy is loop diuretics. Um, and in general, if someone comes in with an acute exacerbation, the guidelines say that you want to double the dose and consider giving it IV. There has been um, something in the last dose trial which basically showed that there's no difference between intermittent high dose versus continuous infusion. So you don't have to put everyone on a Lasix strip or a Bumex strip, just, just hit them hard with it intermittently and that you know, will get you the same effect. And then there's always metolazone, uses a booster. Uh, I find it very effective in patients who have some higher creatinine 
and are really holding on to fluid, you just have to be really careful with hyper, hypokalemia because even if they have renal disease, these are the patients, if you're having them on a lot of metolazone, that they're going to end up needing potassium replacement even if their creatinine is elevated. And then another one that I think is important to mention is anticoagulation because in the past there was a tendency that if people have a very low ejection fraction, like less than 20%, there was always this kind of question like, should we put them on blood thinners? What if they have an apical aneurysm as part of that? Maybe, you know, basically it's been shown in several trials that it's, it's contraindicated unless you have an, another reason to put them on anticoagulation. So unless the patients have AFib, they have a prior thrombotic event or they have a known LV apical thrombus, you don't empirically put people with low ejection fractions on warfarin. You, you, it's too high of a risk of bleeding, so. Uh, so I think it's helpful to talk about um, the way we can classify cardiomyopathies. In general, when we're talking about HEFREF, we apply these medications across all spectrums of HEFREF, but there are some particular etiologies of cardiomyopathy that um, we can handle in a little bit of a different way and also have um, different outcomes than just a general one of the mill. So in general, when we're talking about cardiomyopathy, there's genetic, mixed, and acquired. Um, genetic is things like hokum, uh, ARVC, LV non-compaction, some of the ion, cha iron cha ion channel disorders. Um, there's this mixed bag of dilated and restrictive cardiomyopathies, and among the dilated cardiomyopathies, about, about half of them are ischemic, um, and in that 37% other, um, a lot of that ends up being a, a familial cardiomyopathy if we go through all the genetic testing. And then acquired things like myocarditis, Takotsubo, peripartum, and tachycardia-induced. So some special populations I just wanted to touch on because they have um, interesting and often better outcomes than just general one-of-the-mill um, HEFREF. The first being alcohol-mediated cardiomyopathy. It's important to remember that just being a drinker, you know, your patient comes in, they have a dilated cardiomyopathy, and they say they drink, you know, three beers a day. That's really not enough. You can't say, oh, it's because of your alcohol intake. This requires a high amount of alcohol consumption. So an average greater than five drinks a day for many, many years before you can really say that it's due to the alcohol. And really with abstinence and, and alcohol use and good heart failure medication, you often see a significant improvement and normalization of the LV function. The other type of cardiomyopathy that you can see a very good outcome with um, just control is tachycardia mediated. Usually this is heart rates consistently above 110 beats per minute and it's very rarely with sinus tachycardia. So this occasional uh, inappropriate sinus tachycardia patients you see, you really don't have to worry about them developing a cardiomyopathy the way you do your patients with chronic AFib with RVR. It is reversible with heart rate control. The only variation being if someone has a cardiomyopathy because of frequent PVCs, and they get a, a 24 hour Holter monitor and they have more than 20% of their beats in that 24 hour period being PVCs, you really need to refer them for a PVC ablation in order to see an improvement in their LV function. So these are two types of cardiomyopathy that with basically either withdrawal of the, withdrawal of the offending agent or heart rate, you can see a pretty much normalization of their LV function and a really good outcome. The other type is peripartum cardiomyopathy. I know you heard a lecture on this earlier, so I'm just gonna touch on it, but basically um, it's diagnosed one month prior to delivery up to five months post, and it really has a very good chance of recovery. Uh, quoted as 50 to 60% of these patients recover with good medical therapy. About 25% of them go on to have stable heart failure, and about 25% will actually go on to either have progressive heart failure and require transplantation. The risk factors is uh, older age, multiparity, multiple gestations, preeclampsia or hypertension, and then the use of uh, beta agonists to delay labor. Chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy. This type of cardiomyopathy it doesn't have the best type of outcome. It's, um, I wanted to mention it specifically because we see it a lot more in women. Um, specifically, patients who have chemotherapy with anthracyclines, doxorubicin is most commonly used as part of the chemotherapy for breast cancer and also a lot of hematologic malignancies. 
and also the, one of the newer agents, Trastuzumab, for breast cancer. Um, in those types of cancers, especially breast, most of the patients are women. However, as I mentioned before, there is this um, evidence that it seems as though women, um, even those who are getting, it, getting this type of chemotherapy not for just breast cancer, they tend to develop higher rates of cardiomyopathy. And it seems like women, for whatever reason, are more sensitive to the myocardial toxic effects of, of chemotherapy. Overall, this type of cardiomyopathy has a much worse prognosis than the other types of HEFREF. And it's very important that these patients have an earlier diagnosis and thus earlier chance to get started on this guideline-directed medical therapy to increase their chances of having LV recovery. It's pretty much been shown in several studies that if the patient gets started on therapy within six months of the development of the cardiomyopathy, they do much better. And then if they get started on therapy more than 12 months after the development of the cardiomyopathy, it's very unlikely and nearly 0% chance that they'll have any improvement in their heart failure. So a lot of places now have developed these departments of cardio-oncology um, where patients get echoes after every cycle of chemotherapy um, to see if they've had changes in their LV function to help guide the oncologist uh, and best how to treat them. Uh, specifically for anthracycline-based chemotherapy, it's dose-dependent. Um, for trastuzumab, once you see the ejection fraction drop, you can actually withdraw the agent, see the EF normalize, and then you can restart it safely. And overall, these patients have an increased incidence of right ventricular dysfunction and, and along with left ventricular dysfunction. And so that can be an important consideration should they need advanced therapy down the road, like an LVAD. They have much higher rates of needing right-sided support, um, like a BIVAD or a temporary RVAD, when they go for mechanical support. So that definitely impacts their outcomes. And then another special population that um, pretty much has a pretty poor outcome, but you can try to step in a little earlier to uh, change that is sarcoid. Um, classically on the pathology, you see non-caseating granulomas. It's usually a dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, they often present with conduction blocks because the sarcoid tends to involve the interventricular septum where the um, electrical pathways are. They classically have aneurysm formation in weird areas of the myocardium, as you can see on this echo. They have it in the septum, in the inferior lateral wall, not, not always in the apex. Um, a lot of the patients will be of Scandinavian descent, sometimes Japanese and African Americans. Diagnosis with um, biopsy, um, you can also see it with some changes on MRI. And then you can also see the amount and activity of sarcoid in FDG PETs. Uh, you treat it with steroids, but in patients with advanced sarcoid, 80% of the death is due to cardiac disease. So it's actually recommended that if you have a patient with sarcoid, you at least screen them for heart involvement. And the easiest way to do that is either an MRI or an FDG PET, which they do that here. Um, and another one to be kind of aware of is giant cell myocarditis. These people pre present very dramatically. Uh, they come in in fulminant cardiogenic shock. They often have elevated biomarkers, but not always. They have very unstable arrhythmias. VT storm is also something that they'll present with. Um, you diagnose, diagnosis with a uh, biopsy or with an MRI, and you basically blast them with steroids plus or minus IVIG, and you'll see them turn around really fast. Uh, but that's the important thing because if you don't catch it, you'll see them go the other way very quickly because they're so unstable. A lot of these patients will require temporary ECMO support to get them through uh, the period until they recover. And then something that's important to note is in these patients, when they recover, they sh a lot of, you know, when they do make it through, they say, what do I do now? What can I do? Well, they can do pretty much anything but no competitive sports for three to six months. I actually had a patient um, like this a few weeks ago as a 19-year-old. She just like showed up in the hospital and we put her on ECMO and hit her with steroids and she walked out of the hospital and it was, it was incredible. Another uh, particularly interesting type of cardiomyopathy is left ventricular non-compaction. 
these patients. Um, it's a genetic disease, uh, really not sure of all the genes involved and what makes people progress to heart failure because in the community you can see patients who have LV non-compaction but have normal ejection fraction. Um, they do have possibly an increased risk of sudden cardiac death. They should not participate in competitive sports. That's important when you're counseling your patients who have LV non-compaction. No competitive sports. Um, if they have an ejection fraction less than 35%, they should be placed on warfarin for full anticoagulation to prevent formation of thrombi in these little crevices in their LV. And it's also important to know the indications for ICD for these patients, which includes a family history of sudden cardiac death, if they have lots of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia on monitoring, if their EF is less than 35%, and also if they have unexplained syncope. And then um, finally, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. You know, classically this involves uh, men as in a three to one uh, ratio, but women are uh, diagnosed with this, uh, you know, occasionally. And it's important to remember for them that you also have to advise them and their first degree relatives that they cannot be active in sports. Um, this is a really uh, recognized uh, cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes but it doesn't have to be if we can pay attention to our patients, screen them. You see this classic epsilon wave on their EKG. So it's just something to keep in your back of your mind as you're seeing patients. So um, I have just a few questions, so we'll kind of test um, some knowledge. So the first question is, and it'll just be free answer, just call out what you think the answer is. So there's a 45-year-old African-American woman with breast cancer, and she has had anthracycline-based chemotherapy with her last dose given three months ago. And she was diagnosed with chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy with an EF of 25%. She does have some fatigue and dyspnea with climbing, you know, even a few stairs. Which initial medications would you prescribe? So let's go through the options. Would you put her on metoprolol tartrate and lisinopril, carvedilol and losartan, carvedilol and lisinopril, or hydralazine iracidol combination and lisinopril? So um, you know you want to put her on your good guideline directed medical therapy. So that includes a beta blocker, right? First line beta blocker 1A, and it should all be on beta blockers. And we want to use those evidence-based beta blockers. So is metoprolol tartrate one of those? No. So carvedilol. And then I haven't given you any evidence that she's ACE intolerant. And so 1A, also an ACE. So the answer here would be carvedilol and lisinopril. Okay, and even though she's symptomatic, she's not, not yet done on any other medical therapy, so you wouldn't jump first to the hydralazine isodyl combination. That's more for class three, four heart failure if they're already tolerating their guideline-directed medical therapy, but still symptomatic. Okay, any questions about that question? Question two. The same patient comes to you a year later, and you do an echo, and her EF is now 55%. Yay. And she asks, can she stop her medications because they're kind of a hassle for her to take every day? And what do you tell her? No. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so we kind of talked about that. Uh, she cannot discontinue either medication. Okay. You want to keep her on those, watch her, watch her LV function. Um, and you still want to kind of try to titrate her medications as well. Question three. A 69-year-old man with coronary disease and ischemic cardiomyopathy has an EF of 30%. He's on his guideline-directed medical therapy with long-acting metoprolol, captopril, and a plerinum. His resting heart rate's 85, and his blood pressure's 110 over 65. He can climb stairs at home without any dyspnea or chest pain, and he doesn't have any edema, so he's feeling pretty good. What changes to his medications do you recommend? So my first question is, which NYHA class is this patient? He can climb stairs, he doesn't have any symptoms when he exerts himself. He's a one. He's a one. Okay. So he's an NYHA one. He's on a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, and aldosterone receptor antagonist. His heart rate's 85 and his blood pressure is 110 over 65. 
So, do we make no changes? He's doing great. Keep doing what you're doing. Do we stop his captopril and start Entresto? Do we increase his metoprolol? Do we start Corlinor? What do you guys think? So this one, this one's a tricky question. It has a few, a few extra things in it. So the answer is you want to increase his metoprolol succinate, okay? So the, the key to this question, the root of it is, even though people are doing well, you want to try to maximize their medications because you're going to get the best bang for your buck at the highest doses that they can tolerate, okay? And you know that he needs higher dose because his heart rate's 85, and that's not really goal. You really want their heart rate to be less than 70, okay? And so, and I, you know, I, I tried to trick you a little bit. His blood pressure is 110 over 65. That's fine. If someone's EF is 20%, they don't need a blood pressure of 120 over 80. And really, you don't want it to be that high. You want them to be down in like the 100s, the 90s. As long as they're not dizzy, put, push the meds, okay? So, and you don't want to use Entresto because like I said, Entresto is reserved for patients who have symptomatic heart failure. So NYHA class two and three, Okay, we're all kind of tempted to use the newer, fancier things, but the good old fashioned heart failure medications are really what you go for first. And then you wouldn't use Corlinor because they're currently not on maximally tolerated doses of beta blocker. Okay, questions about this question. In which patient with HEF-REF would you add hydralazine nitrate combination? A white man with a class 3 heart failure who's already on an ACE and a beta blocker. A white woman, class 3 heart failure, who's not yet on medical therapy. An African American man who has class 3 heart failure is hypertensive and not yet on therapy. An African American woman, class 2 heart failure, who's on an ACE and beta blocker already. Or an African American man who has class 3 heart failure who is already on an ACE and a beta blocker. We're hearing C, E, e. e. okay, E, good. So we know that we use hydralazine nitrate combinations in predominantly African Americans, that's when the data is. Um, patients who are on guideline-directed medical therapy with an ACE or an ARB and a beta blocker and still symptomatic, which is class three or four, so you're exactly right. Um, last question. 55-year-old woman's referred to you after diagnosis of dilated non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and you look at her echo, and these are still images for you. And this is what we see in her echo. Anyone notice thing particular? <laughs> Dr. Coulter. Let's see, is this a pointer? So, especially here, and then this is short axis here. What is this? What is she? What kind of cardiomyopathy does she have? LB non-compaction. Good. So she has mild fatigue while at work. She's an ICU. This is my. This is an actual patient I have, by the way. Um, she's an ICU nurse. She has some dyspnea when climbing stairs. No one in her family has ever had sudden cardiac death, and she's never passed out. Um, before she came to see you, her referring physician had already done a Holter monitor on her and she didn't have any arrhythmias, no non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. And so you're going to start her on good medical therapy with carvedilol and lisinopril. And what else should you recommend? Now remember, oh I didn't tell you this, but her EF is 20%. What's her PRS? She's just getting started on medical therapy. Yes, her, we'll say her QRS, her QRS duration is 150. Entresto, warfarin, hydralazine, isodil, or should you put it in ICD? Or some combination of the two, but single best answer. So she's new to medical therapy, and what NYHA class is she? I'd say she's a two. Okay. So class two, new to medical therapy, you just started Carveta Law and Lisinopril. I'm trying to give you that she doesn't have any of the scary scary risk factors that tell you that you have to jump to an ICD. Okay. And remember we, we put ICDs in patients unless they have some immediate indication. We give them 90 days of medical therapy before we do the ICD. 
So it's not ACD. Will we give her Entresto now? Probably not, because we're just starting her medical therapy. Same with hydralazine or isodil. We do that if they're already trying to medica tolerating medication. So the answer is warfarin. She has LV non-compaction. Her EF is less than 35%. She is at risk of developing mural thrombi in those little crevices. And so the key to this is just to remind you that patients with LV non-compaction with an EF of less than 35%, unless they have a contraindication, should be on full anticoagulation with warfarin to prevent them from having strokes. That's a hard one. I can't, I can't, I can't quote you uh, evidence on that. But the likelihood is less, so you'd have a lower... You'd have a lower, yeah. That, that ICD's going there. Yeah. But I will tell you that this is my patient, and her LV function has improved, and she is not getting an ICD, at least right now. So, um, so it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> Oh, I have another though. I have another patient though who's a man who has LV non-compaction and his LV function isn't going anywhere. So I mean, yeah. Well, and the hard thing was, too, um, it, her echo wasn't really that obvious that she had LV non-compaction, so I sent her for an MRI, um, and that was very clear that she had non-compaction. Um, and the EF on her MRI after, and I, and I well, actually had been a while, she'd been in medical therapy. Had